Welcome, friends. Greetings, blessings to you this day. The International Society welcomes you to the 31st Annual Conference online titled Gathering Light and Truth from All Nations. Our prayer will be offered this day by board member Francesco Di Lillo from Brussels, Belgium, after which President Kevin Worthen, president of BYU, will welcome all participants. He will be followed by Robert Griffiths, president of the society, who will introduce the conference theme. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the opportunity and the blessings that we have to join together by means of technology for this annual conference of the International Society. We're grateful for the excellent speakers inspired that we will be blessed to hear. We ask you to bless them, that they may share their thoughts and ideas in a way conducive to, to do good things and inspire us to do good. We ask you to bless us, that we may be tools as we go on with our professions, to be good examples and good citizens and good representatives of thy church. We ask the Heavenly Father to give us the guidance of thy spirit. We may be able to reach out to those in need, to support them, and to be thy tools in blessings to their lives. As we go over this conference, we ask thee to help us to catch the prompting the promptings of thy spirit, that we may learn those things that we need to learn, we may understand those things that we need to understand for the betterment of our lives and the lives of those around us. And we ask thee to bless those who are sick, that for some reasons have not been able to join us, that they may uh, feel thy love and the love of those close to them. And we humbly say these things. Heavenly Father, in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. On behalf of Brigham Young University, it's my pleasure to greet you as we begin the 31st Annual Conference of the International Society. I welcome you to our campus. I realize that most of you are not in Provo, but the sign on the entrance to our campus reminds us that the world is our campus. Never has that been more true than at virtual events like this one. I'm glad that you're able to join us no matter what part of our worldwide campus you may find yourself in. The International Society and events like this one give substance to our declaration that the world is our campus. But there are other things that demonstrate the worldwide reach of our campus. According to a recent survey, BYU is number three in the country in producing graduates with foreign language degrees. It's the only private institution among the top 10. And BYU is the top producer of foreign language degrees in Arabic, Russian, and Portuguese. Nearly 65% of BYU students speak a second language with over 130 languages spoken on campus. There are 63 languages taught regularly at BYU and another 30 available from time to time, depending on student interest. Each semester at BYU, over 30% of the student body is enrolled in foreign language classes. The US national average is about 9%. And with over 225 programs in 80 countries, BYU also has one of the most extensive study abroad programs in the United States. Truly, the world is our campus. And it's therefore fitting that we host this annual conference of the International Society because we are preparing students, students to serve worldwide. The topic of this conference, gathering light and truth from all nations is also fitting for BYU. Gathering is a longstanding principle of our sponsoring institution, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. From its inception in the early 19th century, the church has urged its members to gather together in various locations for a variety of reasons, including to facilitate learning. 
The BYU mission statement declares that one of the reasons this university was created is that, quote, the gospel encourages the pursuit of all truth, close quote, wherever and whenever we find it. As Brigham Young put it, all truth is for the salvation of the children of men. Be willing to receive the truth. Let it come from whom it may. So it is appropriate that at BYU, we seek to gather truth from all nations. Moreover, we believe there is a relationship between light and truth and our divine potential. Latter-day scripture teaches that the glory of God is intelligence, or in other words, light and truth, and that a body which is filled with light comprehendeth all things. Thus, this worldwide search to acquire truth and light is a fundamental purpose of a BYU education. So welcome to a worldwide conference on our worldwide campus in which truth and light will be gathered from throughout the world. I'm grateful for your participation and wish you all the best. Thank you for being part of this exciting endeavor. Welcome to our conference. I am grateful for all those who have made this conference possible and to you for listening in. Let me take a few minutes this morning to introduce the theme of our conference this year gathering light and truth from all nations. There has been a plethora of admonitions from church leaders in recent years to show respect for other faiths, to avoid any sense of arrogance in dealing with others, and to support each other in a world that seems to hold less and less esteem for religious believers. What we hope to explore in this conference builds upon that, to consider the divine light that others may have that we may not be considering. In Abraham 3.25, the Lord said to Abraham and others before the beginning of the world, and we will prove them herewith to see if they will do all things whatsoever the Lord their God shall command them. This statement long struck me as a little puzzling. The restored gospel, perhaps uniquely, includes the wonderful knowledge that those who do not have a chance to receive the gospel in this life will have an opportunity after death. Still, it seemed to me that only a really tiny percentage of the people who have dwelt on earth ever truly knew the God who created them, let alone had taught to them his commandments so they could obey them. Our mortal probation, I feared, was embarrassingly inefficient. My puzzlement began to wane, however, with the thought that our Heavenly Father may in fact interact significantly with his children all over the earth and through time, but we may simply be unaware of it. Fortunately, it seems I'm not the only one who has considered this. Elder George Q. Cannon stated, in every nation, men have been raised up and called of the Lord to teach important truths. Other nations and races have not been forgotten by the Lord. They have had great truths taught to them. Orson F. Whitney said, God is using more than one people for the accomplishment of his great and marvelous work. The Latter-day Saints cannot do it all. It is too vast, too arduous for any one people. And closer to our day, Howard W. Hunter taught, we have a common genealogy leading back to God, but more than that, we also seek the true and the beautiful wherever it may be found. And we know that God has blessed all his children with goodness and light in accordance with the conditions in which they find themselves. We do not have a lot of clear guidance on which practices and cultural values outside the church have indeed been inspired of God and which are simply the works of his children, however valuable. But I don't think we should let a lack of clarity turn us away from a potentially rich storehouse of beautiful truths. I memorized as a youth, as I suspect many of you did, an article of faith that says, 
whatever is virtuous, lovely, or of good report or praiseworthy, we seek after these things. My wife Jeannie and I had the opportunity last year to visit the renowned Sikh temple, the Gurudwara Gangla Sahib in New Delhi, India. I am no expert on Sikhism and their accounting of from whence their religion came, a line of inspired gurus, doesn't include any of the standard works that I'm aware of. Nevertheless, I came away particularly impressed with three of their core values. Their reverence for their scriptures, which form the centerpiece of their beautifully adorned golden temples. Their obsession with cleanliness in their temples and their generosity. Each day we were told the temple provides 20,000 meals to those in need financed, prepared, and served by volunteers who believe that in serving other people, they are serving God. We walked through the kitchen where enormous vats were cooking the afternoon meal, and women and men sat chatting away in circles, making large piles of fried bread. Six are asked to donate 10% of their income as well as donating their time and service. When these people stand before the judgment seat of God, do you think they will not have much to talk about until they sit through the missionary discussions? Guru Nanak, the founder of Sikhism, taught that the ideal man establishes union with God, knows his will, and carries out that will. Sounds to me a lot like the Lord's statement to Abraham. We traveled on to Varanasi, the birthplace of Hinduism. It is also in some ways a desperately poor area. You cannot walk through those streets and not feel deep sympathy for so many people. Many Hindu practices seemed to me to be loud and wild and very colorful, sort of the opposite of what I think when considering the sacred. But we spoke at some length with a Hindu man who said, we are a joyful, optimistic people. We know that things are going to get better, if not in this life, then in the next. Why should we not dance? He continued, I know you see our poverty and pity us, but if Westerners think that money is all there is to life, then you really are poor. Food for thought. The restored gospel has truth and light that benefit all people. Every life of a child of our heavenly father can be enriched by a knowledge of the savior and blessed by his saving ordinances. Why then should we care about what other light and knowledge may have been given to the earth, especially when it's not clear which beliefs and practices may have a divine origin? I offer three reasons for your consideration. One, it may guard against arrogance. If we appreciate that ours may not be the only game in town, we will interact with others with more humility and equality, and that can only enhance our missionary efforts. President Gordon B. Hinckley, speaking to those of other faiths, said, bring with you all that you have of good and truth, which you have received from whatever source, and come and let us see if we may add to it. Two. It can enrich our lives. As Jeannie and I have had the wonderful opportunity to travel around the world, one thing we are struck with is how many cultures have the symbol of the tree of life. Knowing that, as we consider that symbol in the scriptures, its symbolic power grows. And when our Hindu friend said that Hindus know that things will get better, I thought, yeah, we, we believe that too. 
that maybe we don't believe it enough and could learn more from them. Utah has a depressingly high rate of clinical depression. Three, it reinforces the reality of God. In this increasingly secular world, too many have become discouraged and wonder if religious faith is really something to believe in. But as we become aware of the preponderance of good and true principles that exist in all cultures, brought primarily through religious teachings, the reality of our Heavenly Father and his love for his children becomes hard to dismiss. Should we be concerned about how God's light is given to the world? I think not. Some have postulated that it spread from known origins, carried perhaps by the lost 10 tribes. Others have argued that as each of Heavenly Father's children has the light of Christ, people instinctively respond to common feelings and understandings given by the Holy Ghost. Or perhaps there are indeed called of God in dramatic ways to lead religious and cultural movements, and we just don't have the records yet. None of these possibilities would undermine the restoration that God and his son appeared to Joseph Smith in the spring of 1820 in a visit of transcendent importance. And is not the Book of Mormon a perfect example of how God was dealing with some of his children in a far off time and place, but the biblical covenant people were simply unaware? One thing I believe is clear. Each of God's children should be true to whatever light and knowledge they have been privileged to receive. That is how the Lord's statement to Abraham is fulfilled. That is how God's purposes in creating the world are achieved. So in our conference today, we will hear a wide variety of perspectives, and I expect to learn a lot. My deep thanks to those whose scholarship will enlighten us and to those whose personal experience and insights will enrich us. And we thank BYU and the Kennedy Center for the support that makes this conference possible. Enjoy the program. We will now be honored to participate in a friend-to-friend -friend dialogue with Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and Reverend Andrew Teal, Chaplain and Fellow in Theology, Pembroke College, Oxford University. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, I, my privilege to introduce Dr. Reverend Dr. Andrew Teal, who will be one of the discussants today. Um, after working in a public ministry in Anglican parishes in England for 14 years, Dr. Andrew Teal moved into higher education as head of theology and pastoral studies at Plater College, Oxford, which was founded by the Catholic Jesuit order. He was an appointed chaplain, fellow, and lecturer in theology at Pembroke College, Oxford. There he's taught New Testament Greek, early church history and theology, modern systematic theology across Oxford, and having also taught and examined the reception of Jesus across the ages. He writes on art and has come, in his words, to love the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, exploring possibilities for reconciliation between the families of Christians by collaborative scholarship, mission, and service. He's married to Rachel, a stroke researcher in Oxford. They have two children together. And Andrew is preparing to come to BYU and join the Neil A. Maxwell Institute as an affiliate in autumn 2021, which we're very much looking forward to. Thank you, Elizabeth. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland has been a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles for 27 years. Prior to that calling, he was merely a, a member of the Quorum of the Seventy, president of Brigham Young for many years, uh, commissioner of education for the Church of Jesus Christ, dean of religious education, a BYE professor, and just a darn good guy besides all of that. He is a leader, a lover of uh, humankind, an author, an unparalleled speaker. As we heard Elder Dubay in the Sunday morning session of General Conference, Elder Holland makes the world feel welcome with a 
a pat on the cheek and, and a sincere <laughs> welcoming words. And of course, his wonderful wife is named Pat. Maybe that's where he got the habit. <laughs> So most of all, uh, Elder Holland is simply a true friend, personally and to the entire world. Thank you. We continue. Elizabeth. Thank you. Well, Elder Holland, Dr. Teal, we're so grateful to have both of you share your time with us at the Latter-day Saint International Society and really to let us sit and listen in on your continuing conversation. Um, our hope is this will provide a wonderful opportunity for those watching to hear from you both and to see a fruitful model of interreligious dialogue. Our conference this year, as you know, is grounded in exploring beliefs of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints about God's gifts of light and truth to all peoples and how understanding other religious traditions and beliefs can enrich our own and bring us closer to others and to God. Um, we're hoping just to start this off that Elder Holland, Dr. Tudor, you can tell us a little bit about your friendship. There's a really wonderful and unique set of stories here that I think would be a great place to start. Well, uh, to, to talk about Andrew Teal is simply the easiest, loveliest, warmest invitation uh, I could have. In fact, when, when uh, your offices contacted me to see if if I'd be available and you mentioned Andrew's name, uh, it wouldn't matter where I was, what I was doing, when I was doing it, or with whom I was doing it, I would have changed everything. I would have moved anything uh, to be with, with Andrew. He is simply and truly and affectionately one of the, one of the best friends that I have. Uh, if that doesn't sound unusual across uh, time and space, space is against us by uh, the tune of 3,000 miles or so, and, and time has kept us limited on uh, whether we get a minute in England or a minute in the US. Uh, we don't get very much um, time in either location, but, but uh, maybe time and space don't have anything to do with friendship. Uh, because uh, Andrew is is a, a dear and personal friend, and will be forever. That's great, El Elder Teal. How do you remember uh, Elder Holland? Oops, oops, I called you Elder Teal, but anyway, we like you. How do you remember Elder Holland? Oh, how do I follow that? I mean, I I think what you get from Elder Holland is uh, a tremendous capacity to tell the truth in love. Yeah. Uh, no, it's authentic. Uh, I also think what's what's marvelous is it's not, um, it's not I mean, what he said was very flattery, but from him, it is not. And you hear that from his, um, uh, what he will say in general conference. Um, we were talking a little bit before we started recording, you know, uh, the two general conference uh, speeches I remember most vividly when he was talking about Sunday best and about how it's important to to come to worship prepared and to, to give the Lord attention. I think like that must have been two or even three general conferences ago. But this general conference talking about, if you like, um, that liberty, which is so important, uh, a gift of faith, isn't license. And that there is a, there's an unconditional love does not mean um, unconditional self. Um, there was a beautiful reflection on contention. What what we do and, and and it really spoke to me to be kinder to my own family and 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 to be an apostle uh, to him to be an ambassador if you like of jesus christ um who whose words were always both true and loving um so i think i think what what that's why it means so much to me to hear elder holland say that because i i know that he he is an apostle of truth sustained in truth and full of the spirit of god Okay. You, you, uh, Andrew, thank you. You don't. You don't need any. You don't need any general conference sermons on kindness. You wrote the book on kindness. So, uh, we're, uh, but I'm 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 flattered that you would have uh, listened in. But, well, in in this room, this is where Matt and I had what we used was to it. This yeah. this is the room where I'm sitting, yeah. where Matt Matthew Holland and I met. Uh, I used to call it 
without the coffee. And he, it was here that he said um, that he'd like me to meet you. Um, I added two and two together and got the wrong number. I thought because he was an active member of the Church of Latter of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, that perhaps that perhaps uh, his father was a bit worried about that. <laughs> As it turned out, but then we met in London. But we talked about the Yazidis community, right? Talked about how you instinctively identified with religious groups which were persecuted because you came from a, a, a uh, in the past. Um, and then we had this wonderful celebration that Paul Kerry was absolutely pivotal in my um, where we had a four-way conversation between Roman Catholic, Anglican, Methodist, and Latter-day Saint, with the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rome Williams, Lord David Alton, a senior Roman Catholic gentleman in the um, Francis Young, Wayne from Methodist. Present were Metropolitan Callistos, the head of the Orthodox community here in the UK. And we had a real sense of a new, a new ecumenical movement, a new Oxford movement, as it were, um, where how hard it is to move anything in Oxford, but there seemed to be this <laughs> thing. Uh, uh, and you brought that. And when I first met um, outside the university church, it was as if I'd known them always. And it sounds spooky, but not just an old friend, but almost as if this was somebody who, who I'd known forever. Uh, and by the grace of God, I pray that, that we will know it forever. That's, that's mutual, Andrew. That is a, that's good, uh, good Latter-day Saint doctrine for us. Uh, we, we, we talk about, uh, uh, like Jeremiah, uh, before we were formed in the womb. Uh, so we, we, we count on those relationships going, going back uh, to an earlier, earlier time. That was, yeah, with the, uh, you, you came to, to Baroness Nicholson's uh, little London activity. That's the first time I actually met you. That's the first time I'd shaken your hand. And I thought, my gosh, what a, what a pleasant, jolly, sweet uh, soul. And that was just in the, hubbub of shaking hands and and uh, at the at the club there where 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 she had that lovely luncheon um but you had a profound effect on me even in the mixing and milling of all those people and that's when i told paul carey i said i i have to find a way to to uh, know uh, andrew teal better i just just met him and he said well uh, i i'm i'm the one who can help you do that because because uh, paul had, of course was active and involved with you there on campus so anyway and and then that wonderful foursome uh, I'll, I'll i'll forever cherish uh that activity with with the uh, uh the people you mentioned and rowan williams both rowan williams and and david alton have have continued to correspond with me a little bit uh, uh david alton quite a bit and uh and and rowan and i have exchanged books uh and uh he, he's been very warm and and uh, it's 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 been it's been fun to see the aftermath of that. You had us for dinner too at uh, a high table. Some uh, on on was that at Pembroke? Was that I'm I'm disoriented about wh where we were physically, but I think it was in your college. Well, you, did, uh, you, you spoke in the university church on uh, for the faculty on the Book of Mormon. Um, right, I did. I did. You gave people copies, and what I do do now as part of my daily office. Um, the daily prayers. I will always read a, 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 sort, a, a portion of the uh, Book of Mormon. And uh, when I was over in the United States, uh, Elder Kent Richards and Elder John Taylor gave me the other, the parts two and three, the Doctrine and Covenant. Right, and right. And, yeah. and to read it, I've read it all the way through, all three, all the way through once. And now to be reading it for the second time. Um, yeah. It's strange, isn't it? Because you, you're reading it and you think, I thought I'd read this. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. It's almost as if scripture works, and this is, I think, what you were saying in, when you were talking about the Book of Mormon to the faculty. Um, yeah. That, that living scripture is not about archaeology. It's not about proving something right. This, but it's about having the grace to hear scripture spoke, speak to you, 
Right. Uh, and I think right. that's a, re a really significant yeah. contribution uh, yeah. that you've made in that lecture to the faculty. So you're, you're well known here in Oxford. And of course, you mentioned uh, Elder Oaks, but also Elder Cook. Um, came that's right. Here. That's right. I, 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 uh, yeah, I was just uh, going off the top of my head about the group that have been there, but Elder Cook loved it. He and I were old missionary companions uh, in, in and out of Oxford. So uh, to come back and, and think we could come back to back into the city limits uh, 50 year, years later and not be run out uh, was, was uh, we thought, a sense of accomplishment. So, and, and all of this, all of this contributes to a real sense of um, discerning what, what we are to do now. Yeah, we are sure. Together to gather light and truth from all nations, for yeah. all nations, uh, to prepare people for the kingdom of the world. And, and, and that's, in a sense, what hopefully I'll be turning my attention and, and effort and commitment to when I come to uh, BYU. Terrific. We can't wait. We're very keen on that. And, and the idea of scripture as a base, I think, it's, it, we didn't plan this, uh, uh, the audience out there, this vast international audience. <laughs> you ought to know this is all unrehearsed. Uh, but you, the reference to scripture, Andrew, I think you, you, we, you and I have had that in common from the beginning, uh, a love of, of, of scripture. And, uh, and I'm marking a new set. I, it's hard for me to, it's hard for me to read without a, without a pencil and without a, uh, you know, I, I need to highlight and I need to make arrows and uh, make little notes in the margin. So once I've been through a set of scriptures, I have to set them aside or give them away. And then I start a new set. I'm just starting a new set myself. Uh, and I'm reading concurrently uh, the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants. The whole church is, is reading the, the Doctrine and Covenants this year. But we always are supposed to dabble uh, as we can each day in the Book of Mormon. So I'm doing both of those uh, in a kind of concurrent parallel way. But in honor of, of my love for you and my devotion to things British, I am also doing the uh, Oxford Study Bible, which is the revised English version, um, a hard copy, um, hardback, um, and is a is a delightful uh, uh, work which I am loving. I had read, I'd read forty years ago, thirty years ago. I'd gone through the the, the New English Bible then, um, but this has got some updated scholarship, a much more extensive series of footnotes, uh, and uh, uh, and and of course the apocrypha is included, which I uh, which I find delightful and and use from time to time. But anyway, uh, so I'm I'm running I'm running in my little morning study. I'm running down three paths uh, with the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants and the and the New English version um, in its in its uh, most recent form. And and I think of you uh, when I open uh, that that latter book and uh, and remember uh, how much I love you and how much I enjoy Oxford and how much I'm anxious to have you come and teach at BYU. I look forward to that very much. And, and part, of, part of what I think um, I got when you were here was this sense of, of truthfulness. I've, I've mentioned this before, but it's a truthfulness that is all marked with kindness. You know, it would be lovely to say, um, wouldn't it be great if we could just forget about all the gone wrong over two millennia, all of the bad things that happened in the church, all of the things which, you know, the Reformation and all of that stuff. Uh, no, no, it, would, it wouldn't be good to forget. Um, yeah. as, don't forget our mortal experiences, even the difficult ones. Um, right. Better to listen, to love, to pray, to serve, um, and it'll be a long and demanding task. One of the things that struck me this time through from um, 1 Nephi is when the Lord asks uh, Nephi to do something, to um, I shall construct a ship uh, that, uh, after the manner which I shall show thee. Well, that sounds great. Yeah, I'll do that straight away. Yeah. Well, where's all the bits? And, uh, yeah. the and then he says, uh, no, you've got to go and find ore to make molten and then make tools to construct it and then listen and it's a major task the rebuilding yeah. Yeah. 
of, of our relationship as communities of Jesus Christ is not going to be like a lottery win. It's not going to be... <laughs> God, this is in this lengthy um, journey, which God will prepare for at every point. Um, and that's, in a sense, what, what I get from reading uh, the Book of Mormon and uh, Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price, as scripture, is it reminds me that actually God is intimately involved um, with those early communities and in the life of Joseph Smith. Um, and, and some of the most moving, I, mean, I, I don't embarrass to say, tell you, uh, as a woman, but maybe to hear some of the things when, when uh, Joseph Smith is talking about um, what, what happens and trying to encourage his community not to go down a path of, um, of violence, but of love, to, re yeah. to really embody that missionary invitation. And the very fact, I find this extraordinary, and it's nothing new to any of you, but the very fact that, that it's written to show what great things the Lord hath done to, um, to the enemies of the Nephites. Um, yes. The Jewish community and to the Gentiles. It's outward focused. It's a complete embrace. Um, and I'm guessing, I guess, to that sense of gathering light and truth uh, from all nations is for all nations. Um, that this, in a way, this it's it's written for the Lamanites, the Jews, yeah. the Gentiles, and mission is part of that active love, which is embodying yeah. Uh, yeah. the liveliness of this book, which of which you spoke so extraordinarily when you came to Oxford. You spoke to a, not a cynical group of people, but Oxford theologians can be quite hard-nosed and quite um, sceptical, but you spoke with, with, with such warmth and eagerness, you put yourself on hold and you asked us to do so as well, um, to become living invitations. The fact that, that, that Joseph Smith asked which, which is right. And the biggest scandal is that God, um, the Father, and Jesus Christ appear to him and tell him. And that that's, that sense of intimacy and community with the Lord is what we're offering. Um, so I, I'm ever grateful for your invitation and your introduction to the Book of Mormon. Well, you... <laughs> Of of all of all the little sermons, and uh, 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 the gloss that may have been put on uh, Nephi's building the ship over all these years, you have just scored a first. Your your that that is the first time I think that an Anglican priest has uh, made the the application uh, that we would all make, uh, and that I have made with students over the years. Uh, about uh, that very point of building that ship, it was not simply that he would go down to Home Depot, and uh, and 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 you know it'd it'd, it'd be ready to wheel up wheel out on a trailer. Uh, he he had to go make the bellows and and make the fire and find some ore, uh, and uh, as really it was it was to start from the beginning. And you think of every great movement, um, Christianity itself, the savior of the world. Uh, starting with a handful of Galilean fishermen. And uh, uh, everything starts small and challenging and, uh, and uh, no, uh, no freebies, really, for, for the most part. It's hard work uh, uh, all the way. Uh, I've, uh, I'm, I'll reach my own. Maybe. Okay. Hey, Elizabeth, go ahead. Oh, yeah, well, you, and Ted, you and Ted can't get a word in edgewise. We're not, we're not, we're, <laughs> We're not allowing any intrusions here. Go ahead. I'm just enjoying sitting here and soaking it in. I really love it. But I was thinking of this, as you, of this metaphor of building the bridge, thinking of this in terms of your relationship with each other or any relationship that we have with people of other faiths that gets built over time. And, and watching you and the two engage over scripture reminds me that so often people when it comes to come some kind of interfaith in a relationship or understanding are either scared to bring up religion worried that they're going to offend somebody or they get very defensive and almost hostile or you know trying how can 
how can we do this? It's clear that you all can, can have this kind of relationship where you can talk about meaningful things that you are deeply committed to in a way that brings light and truth rather than just heat and noise. The key is to find somebody as lovely as Andrew Thiel and you're home free. You are, it, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful, wonderful experience from then on in. Andrew makes the difference uh, in this conversation. It's busy. He, he took, uh, now look, you, we're all university people one way or the other over the years, and you know how challenging, he mentioned faculty, uh, and it wouldn't have to be a theology faculty, it could be any faculty, uh, faculties uh, at universities and, and students are, are um, taught to be uh, not pessimistic, but to challenge and to, uh, to think and to uh, not accept anything necessarily at face value. I wasn't sure what I would be facing to go into, uh, to go into the church, um, university church there at Oxford and do what we did uh, to talk about, uh, uh, about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But Andrew, as the moderator, turned every single solitary question, a question from the floor and any comment that I made the other way, he made all of it work. He made all of it sound acceptable and here's an idea and this is the way this fits. Uh, I, you spoiled me, Andrew. I, I, refused, I refused to go on a university campus anymore without you. Uh, the, I want everybody to broker. I want everybody to broker my questions uh, the way you brokered those because you made it. Uh, and I'm really answering Elizabeth's, trying to answer Elizabeth's question that uh, it was uh, it was his gentle manner and taking uh, the the skill of a of a university professor, the skill of a, a great teacher to take something from the floor or take something from a visiting lecturer, turn it, shape it maybe even remold it uh, more dramatically than you might think and hand it back and it and uh, the lecture goes on and the questions go on and everybody seems pretty happy and by the time you've finished uh, you walk out of there as uh, friends and uh, and and fellow scholars in, in a in a sense it was gr you were a great teacher Andrew in that setting you took raw material not unlike ore and uh, and and uh, timber and whatever you took raw material and made a lovely experience out of it. You made my ship float. Uh, somebody said that once, uh, uh, Ted uh, and Elizabeth probably, but certainly Ted will remember Bob Thomas, one of my favorite professors. Uh, and Bob, in a lecture, once said, "When you launch your ship, it has to float. You can't explain anything to the ocean." Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, you made my ship float that day, uh, Andrew, and it was a courtesy. It was a professional courtesy that you did that. Andrew, well, do you want to respond to that question, Elizabeth's question? Well, I, I'll do so by, by saying, actually, I, I don't, didn't feel very professional. It felt deeply personal because <laughs> one of the things that Elder Holland did was a person inviting us to personhood for the most profound uh, experience and adventure to launch out into together um, by, yes, by attentive and, and properly respectful listening and clarifying, but pushing far beyond the sort of, uh, rather static respect into a real attentive love. And, uh, and that's what happened. That's what happened in, it doesn't happen very often, to be honest, in, in the university level. Because in fact something takes off. It's almost as if um, we had an, a, a new Oxford movement, a new Oxford apostle. Um, <laughs> we did have, if you like, the, the, the to change the metaphor from a boat to to, to timber. Uh, it, it was dampened by so much um, skepticism and doubt. It came of, of the spirit of God. Um, and I guess that's it. In a way, um, we, we try to as you say, Terry was immensely um, attentive, but it was that unconditional sense of being surprised by love, um, by, by 
surge of real value. There wasn't a person in that room that didn't know what Elder Hunt was saying, was there? I'm sort of quoting. But there's no one that's ever, that, that is a, in the world, no one that's ever been, no one that ever will be, upon whom God has for authentic, transforming death. And this was an invitation for us to stand and ask, just as uh, the confused, beleaguered Joseph Smith had asked, Heavenly Father, where do I go? Um, and the answer was, we walk together. We go on this journey. Um, by the power of the Holy Ghost, uh, we walk in Christ. Um, and that's what I, I won't let go of. Um, uh, I, I'm not going to let go of that until my mortal finally fails me and releases. <laughs> Won't even let you go then. But, okay. Well, I'm not going to let. I'm not going to let go of that. Let me Thank you, a, Andrew. Let me pose a question to both of you, as we're dealing with the theme of our conference of gathering light and truth from all religious traditions. I, in my own religious traditions, am deeply committed to the truths that I feel. How do I talk about and accept truths in other religions? How do I, how do I harmonize my conviction that I have the truth if there are truths in other religious traditions? That harmony, that ability to harmonize, I ask you to address that topic. Am I clear enough to... Yeah, yeah, Andrew, you 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 go first. I'm I'm talking too much. No, you're not. No, you're not. Um, I think one of the things is it's, it has to be has to have integrity. Um, there is a way in which we know um, in our life what what has spoken to us most authentically of truth um, with integrity, uh, truth in its beauty, love in its tenderness, um, and and to be part of a journey. To, be, to say yes um, to the presence of God doesn't mean to, to turn and, and, and turn into a pillar of salt. Uh, it means to, to say yes to the post-dated check of the Holy Ghost. We don't know where this is going to end, but we don't have to deny any of the truthfulness of our community. I'm not a tribal Anglican. I don't fit into any of the you know, evangelical Catholic or whatever it is, liberal wings. But this is the people whom I've travelled and from whom I've learned so much. Like the George Herbert, um, uh, and I love some of the all of that intuition. I works like um, Catholic writer General Manley Hopkins that the, the world is charged with the grandeur of God. When we find the truth somewhere, we shouldn't be embarrassed about saying this is wonderful and overwhelmed astonished to find God here but why you know, because I'm surprised by the joy of his presence storytelling I know that Taylor Holland uh, is uh, very much into American literature of the 19th century those stories are invitations to uh, transforming truth a lot of a lot of people find it almost betraying things that brought them life to admit well actually this Muslim might have a spirituality, which I can learn. Um, but we shouldn't be so brittle. Um, the one who calls us is faithful, and he's faithful in what, what he's called us to, but he's not going to leave us stuck. Um, so I do, I understand that we have to have integrity, we have to have loyalty, to the community. we have to have a sense of um, owning up to scripture. When I'm reading my book, Old or New Testament, scriptures from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or the saints. Um, I have to have that sense of vulnerability, open, openness. Um, how can I best respond to this? Um, to be true to God, to be true to one another, and to grow into the best and most authentic person that the Lord would have me become. So I, I do understand that people feel perhaps afraid that um, dialogue or, or mission, I'd love to do mission together, you know, with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints. You, we, uh, you, you do, you do, you take, this, you take the missionaries out. We do, I meet them weekly, but, but they, they can use. 
The world can get so disenchanted, and our job is to re enchant them. And, and the show, <laughs> sing, to sing a love song of the Lord Jesus to our world in such suspicion and need and vulnerability. And I see these young men and women um, and all of the structures, you know, you have um, people who are older who come and do a, be part of the support. And I see what they're doing and it just, it's just so inspiring. Um, and so it's a delight to be part of that mission. Wouldn't it be great to actually go on a mission together, have a mission field? <laughs> Be delighted to do that and when i see some people in in the in the uh, streets of oxford talking to somebody there was a, a beautiful black young black woman talking outside marks and spencers to two um, <laughs> missionaries and uh, she looked at me and looked a bit guilty and i said no you listen to them because they will tell you about the wonderful the wonder of our connectedness as family and the wonder of a god who will not leave us divided and and will reveal to us extraordinary things that we don't even dream about ourselves. And they looked a bit bewildered because it was just after you'd been. <laughs> <wasn't quite laughs> as I am now. But but I think that sense of doing it so, together to re-enchant a disenchanted world um, is. Well, I mean, don't don't don't. If people get upset and worried about it, then we listen and we try to comfort and uh, but not collude. God's bigger. Christ is bigger than this. Yeah. Well, you're the you're the you're the master you're the master uh, enchanter. Uh, look, uh, whoever that uh, lovely black woman was, people are not used to seeing an Anglican cleric introduce our missionaries <laughs> to, to to the to the next lesson that they're going to give. So you've got it. You've got to uh, cut her a little slack that she is uh, she's not used to seeing that because none of the rest of us are used to seeing it either. But the words you've used, Andrew, integrity, authentic, enchanting, uh, surprised by, by love, um, the, the, that you, you, that's your self-portrait. Uh, I know you didn't mean that, but uh, uh, didn't intend that, but you are what you are. Uh, integrity, uh, that's, uh, that's Andrew Teal. That's, that's the way uh, a conversation can start and continue uh, to have people like you bless people like us, uh, Elizabeth and Ted uh, will know in our in our religious uh, traditions and community and doctrine. We 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 were fond of circles. Uh, I guess that's we didn't create that. Uh, we're not the first to uh, to espouse that, but we talk about all truth being circumscribed into one great whole. Uh, and so Ted's Spanish. Um, uh, needs to fit with uh, with my American lit and your theology, uh, and uh, and somewhere uh, those pieces are going to come together in one great whole. And uh, as somebody said, when there are questions, when there are questions and it doesn't seem to be resolved, uh, don't worry because things work out in the end. And if they don't seem to be working out, it's because it isn't the end. Uh, so. Uh, time, time is a factor, but I think we gather these pieces and they become uh, part of this circle. And we we hold circles uh, sacred in our uh, in some of our ritual. Um, and the other issue that's that's sort of that's 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 one image. Another image is linear, and that is that we believe uh, that we were together before this world was. And we were taught things, and when we get here, we hear echoes. We we hear uh, we hear we see shadows, and and there are figures, and there are tropes, and there are memories, and we say, "I've I've heard that before," or or I know that's true, uh, and uh, and we don't necessarily have any great reason to uh, to have, to to say that we knew it was true or that we'd heard it before, but we feel that, and that's because. Things started before a long time ago, and they'll continue. And so you've got things being added on on a on a linear uh, dimension, and you've got things being gathered together in a in a in a um, a more three dimensional way, I guess, in a circle or a globe of of uh, truths that we gather here and gather there. And we just have to wait. We just uh, 
We just have to be patient and not make harsh judgments uh, be, uh, because w if we do, we'll be making those in ignorance. And ignorance is very expensive. Somebody said education is sure expensive these days, and the only thing more expensive than that's ignorance. Uh, so uh, we just we have to wait, I think, to have um, Ted's question ultimately answered. And I suppose that's what we try to do in universities. Uh, is to uh, encourage uh, encourage students to gather as this little devotional, this little forum is is trying to do that we gather light from whatever source we can find it, wherever it is in the world, however distant it might be, geographically speaking, or different uh, faith traditions or different uh, uh, professional backgrounds that aren't aren't necessarily grounded in any kind of religious faith, but there will be religious elements to it. There will be truths that we say we knew and we heard and, uh, and, and, it, and it feels right when we, uh, when we hear it again. Um, there, the, the, the world is full of wonderful echoes uh, from, a, from an earlier voice uh, that's penetrating and powerful and um, uh, it's not in the whirlwind. Uh, and it's not in the fire, uh, but it's still and small and uh, powerful. Good. Elder Holland, I wanted to ask one slight follow-up question, uh, just as an example. You've traveled to India quite a bit or many other uh, world areas, Africa. <clears throat> what truths have you felt from Hinduism or, or from African religions that that you feel are extant in those cultures or those traditions? Anything come to mind besides the, the echoes of a, a pre-mortal existence? Oh, yeah, sure. I, uh, some of it uh, is just in the, in the culture almost. Uh, and, and of course, it's really hard to separate culture from, from religion. I think, I think ultimately culture is always religious, but that's my, that's my bias. Uh, that's because I think that's who we are. But uh, you have things that come out of out of the culture that just that just um, uh, shout uh, truth and 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 harmony and integrity. To use uh, Andrew's wonderful wonderful world, for example, I I supervised in Africa for twelve years, uh, and that was uh, that was just before you and I went to Chile, uh, Ted and. Uh, I didn't. I didn't live there residentially the way we did in Santiago, but I. But I was there a lot. I all over the continent, and the irrepressible joy that I found in 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 African natives was uh, was something that I just. Um, well, let me back up. Uh, the 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 phrase that. Reverend Stendhal used at Harvard when he visited BYU was that he spoke of holy envy, that that it was in, we were entitled to be envious of some traditions as long as it was holy, as long as it was uh, for a, a good purpose, and uh, and that and so if I spoke of holy envy uh, in Africa, it would be the the buoyancy, the irrepressible joy among people who had nothing, who uh, for all intents and purposes in material ways didn't have, didn't have what my uh, in garbage disposal had in my kitchen sink uh, or, or clothing uh, that, that I would have given to, to uh, Goodwill Industries, um, they, they would have prized. But that didn't seem to have anything to do with their joy and their happiness. I think of Africa and I think of the people that I met there who were so, so happy. In, in, in a Muslim tradition, uh, I, I, I have some responsibility for interfaith connection with the Muslim world and a, a little. And, uh, and, and if I had holy envy for something in their tradition, it would be their loyalty to prayer. Uh, Christians are supposed to pray, and I pray, but boy, the Orthodox Muslims with whom I've been do not, you do not interfere with that, uh, with that prayer uh, experience uh, five times a day. And, uh, and it starts early in the morning and it goes late at night and you don't let anything interfere. 
uh, because it's precious to them. I, that's something I, I envy. So I, yeah, Ted, I don't want to belabor this, but uh, I could go around the world and uh, and tap uh, cultures where I have seen things that I've said. Uh, I wish I were better that way. I, that's something I can learn. That's something I can adopt. That's something I can embrace uh, and do do better with. Uh, it'd be a it'd be an unusual part of the world. It'd be an unusual people somewhere. Uh, who I I'm I'm not sure, but it it'd be a very unusual population where we did not learn something from from uh, those people, uh, a given a group of people wh whose faith, whose religion, whose devotion, whose loyalty um, weren't uh, uh, better than better than my own in in some ways. I want to glean that. I want to embrace that. Thank you very much. Reverend Teal, would you care to respond to the same question? What, what, what holy envy do you find in, in other religions with which you've associated? Well, I love the, the social dimension in the local synagogue. The fact that uh, after the prayers and the humor um, action, there are, there are there is, um, usually chicken soup, which is lost on speaking the good. But also in Oxford, we do have an interfaith. We have a walk of witness uh, where we walk from the synagogue via the university church where Elder Holland spoke um, to other faith communities, Hindu and ending up in the mosque. The hospitality of that is, is extraordinary. Um, so I would, I would say uh, that, that in a sense that one of the things that happens when you're close enough to someone, when you're friends with people, is you can ask challenging questions. This is what, uh, coming back, I'm sorry to reiterate this, but Elder Holland's love is unconditional, but it's very challenging because it's almost saying, uh, it's like Jesus asked uh, his disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, oh, well, they say that. And, but, and he says, who do you say that I am? And I had an experience of that, if I may uh, share, when I was at uh, um, Elder and Sister Holland's, uh, and there was a, a beautiful old man uh, there called President But he was a beautiful, tender person. And he said to me very, um, very tenderly, uh, the end times, the latter days. Now, it, in, in polite company in England, you don't talk about religion and politics, and, and so, <laughs> uh, but, it, but it's not talked about, uh, that sort of thing. And I stopped for a while, and I thought, after, after he'd spoken, I had a sense of wanting to say, or wanting to find the words to say, we long for your coming glory, the coming of the Lord Jesus. We long for that. But I also knew that as I was thinking that, it's not going to be an easy ride. The coming of the Lord in glory is going to be challenging. Yeah. And many of the things I hang on to then go into the kingdom. Um, Thomas Aquinas spoke about what would happen at the last days when he went to the gates and St. Peter said, you can come in, but your wheelbarrow full of books stays out. <laughs> The things that we think of as indispensable, a core to who we are, we have to be willing to trust tr and trust them into the wounded, pierced hands of Jesus Christ, who knows every human pain and doubt and fear, but won't leave us there. So I, I guess that's what I was also saying. It, it's being close enough to be open, to being challenged, to grow together. Beautiful. Beautiful. You know, you mentioned, uh, we're, we're probably running out of time, but it'd be fun just to continue this very theme. Uh, you mentioned the synagogue, uh, Andrew. Um, my, my association with the Jewish community and building the, the BYU Center in Jerusalem and uh, um, some of those uh, early conflicts and then resolution and, and happiness and goodwill that have followed. Uh, you talk about... Uh, Holy envy. I I have uh, I've wished that that uh, Latter Day Saints were as devoted to, to the Sabbath as our Jewish friends uh, are. Uh, if you've been invited, as you all have, I'm sure, uh, been invited to a, 
a, a, a traditional Shabbat in a, in a Jewish home, it is an experience. It is singing and food and blessings and uh, husband to wife and parent to child. And, and if the children are away, they make their way home for Shabbat. And if they can, and, and on and on. It, well, we, I, we, don't, I, we don't need to go on and on, but we could about uh, uh, things that are so beautiful in traditions um, other than our own, but but which are not inconsistent with our own, and and we ought to uh, we ought to work harder at to gleaning and absorbing and uh, and embracing and uh, pulling those together in our lives rather than uh, keeping them apart. Thank you, Elizabeth. Any comment? Those are wonderful thoughts to conclude on. Maybe if we had but give each of you a minute or two um, to reflect on what our conversation today and this idea of God giving light and truth to others, the, the goodness of God, the love that we feel from him. Um, we'd love to hear your witness of that and um, some concluding thoughts. Would you mind taking, we'll start Dr. Tio with you, just take take a couple minutes. I think glad to. What's, what's come across? Go, go Andrew. Go. Come across today is um, it's quite clear, and I, and I never didn't think about this in terms of, of but our, our life in the world, our love, our families is actually all part of our mission. That that pre-temporal past, which our heavenly Father gives us, is actually worked out without our seeing it. We don't. We got. We can't see all the details. Things that I think particularly is that people of faith is something quite, quite um, counter. What the secular people um, are, are do not think that people are capable of profound change. So you'll be written off uh, and put into uh, a category. Um, that, for example, may be said that oh, that person um, comes from a, a family where there is addictive behaviour, they're an addict, they're not sound. But, but it, actually, the missionary loves people enough to tell the truth, but, but not to actually trap them by it. Um, we are convinced that the right combination of friendship, love, argument, emotion and experience can lead to life-altering transformations for individuals, our society, and our world. And that's what I love about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Thank you. Elder Holland. Uh, I know we're short on time, but uh, thank you, Andrew, for you've been so generous. You always are. You, uh, you, you personify what I've been trying to describe. You, uh, you deflect uh, admiration to yourself and and uh, re reverse it and hand it back uh, to others. The, the reason there's light everywhere and the reason we should look for it and embrace it wherever we can find it is because God is our father and we are his children and we have more in common than we have to separate us. We have more... Uh, unifying uh, influence in our lives, divinely speaking, than we do uh, have hostility or alienation. Or what man is there of you whom if his son asks bread, will give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will give him a serpent. If ye then, being evil, and that's a little excessive, but being fallen, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? God has spent his lifetime and ours giving good things to people all over the world and we're 
we're entitled to find them and to embrace them and to love them and to know that uh, those people to whom we go are our brothers and our sisters in the family of God and under the parenthood of heaven uh, and that there's nothing such a father in heaven would not do for us or give to us. Uh, and I believe that, and uh, Andrew Teal is one of those gifts to this church and to our world. And I love you, Andrew. Look forward, look forward to having you here in Provo. It's 18 but hours. Not, but you're not allowed to come without Rachel, okay? And, and if, I can, if I can say back, um, the words that, that, that took root in your presence here, but when our Lord says, in so much as you do for the least of these, my brethren, you do for me. Yeah. You, you not only bore witness to him, but you also showed the value to everyone who you spoke, to whom you spoke. Um, and I guess that's the whole part of an apostle. So I'm Thank you. Thank to have you as my dearest friend, for whom I pray every day. Thank every you, Andrew. Day. I love you. Truly. And Ted and Elizabeth, we love you. Thank you. Oh, thank you so thank much, you. Elder Holland and Dr. Teal. We're so grateful for the opportunity to spend some time with you and listen and learn from you. Thank you. Our next panel is titled Divine Truth in World Faith Traditions. I'm excited to introduce our presenters and look forward to hearing from them. Our first presenter will be Thomas McConkie, who's the founder of the Lower Light School of Wisdom a nonprofit organization that supports human flourishing through contemplative practice and adult development. Raised as Latter-day Saint, he discovered Buddhism as an 18-year-old, which remains a wellspring of inspiration over 20 years later. He's trained as a developmental researcher, facilitator, and mindfulness teacher, and heads the Lower Light Sangha in Salt Lake City, Utah. Dr. Ahmed Salah is a leader of Muslim students, or Imam at BYU, he obtained his civil engineering bachelor from Cairo, Egypt in 1995, a master's from Holland in 1999, and a PhD from BYU in 2009. He also earned an MBA degree from BYU in 2016. Dr. Salah is active in interfaith discussions and has participated in numerous interfaith groups on and off BYU campus, locally and internationally. Dr. Ravi Gupta, holds the Charles Red Chair of Religious Studies at Utah State University. He obtained a doctorate in Hindu studies from Oxford University, where he's a permanent research fellow of the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies. Dr. Gupta is the author or editor of four books, including an abridged translation of the Bhagavata Purana, published in 2017 by Columbia University Press. He's been a long time participant of interfaith activities, and in 2008, he had the opportunity to meet Pope Benedict XVI on behalf of Hindus during the pontiff's visit to the United States. Finally, we look forward to hearing from Fiona Givens. She was born in Nairobi, Kenya, educated in British convent schools and converted to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Frankfurt, Germany. She earned degrees in French, German and European history from the University of Richmond while co-raising six children She's currently a research associate at the Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship at Brigham Young University and has written four books with her husband, including their most recent book, All Things New, Rethinking Sin, Salvation, and Everything in Between, released last year. We look forward to hearing from our panelists. Hello, I'm really happy to have the invitation to speak here at the uh, annual conference of the International Society. Uh, what I want to talk about briefly is, uh, in my opinion, what is a huge opportunity we have as Latter-day Saints, as Christians, as human beings to live a life in the spirit. And I know this is a familiar topic to us. It's, it's a dear topic to us. How do we live a life uh, that is animated by and guided by the Holy Spirit? Uh, but I, I count myself lucky, I kind of fell into uh, Buddhist practice as an adolescent, and unexpectedly, my formation in the Buddhist tradition uh, offered me 
a really precious insight into what the Holy Spirit is and how it works in our lives. So I'd just like to tell a story about my own personal experience in Buddhist practice and how that led to a whole new way of relating to the Holy Spirit and what I think it might mean for uh, any of us who are interested in developing and deepening our relationship with the Holy Spirit. So where the story starts, um, you know, not uh, uncommon for a 13-year-old kid I was really bored with church and didn't see what the point was. And maybe a little less commonly, I was kind of preternaturally stubborn about it and told my parents I refused to go to church. And at the age of 13, I just dropped off all attendance and all participation with the church, which led to a kind of five year dry spell where I don't think I realized that at the time, but in hindsight, I definitely felt a spiritual vacuum and a void my life. And interestingly, when I moved into my first college apartment near campus, there was a Zen Buddhist center in a thriving community just a couple blocks away. And I happened to, you know, I think I saw a flyer one day, maybe stapled to a telephone pole or a bulletin board saying that there was a Buddhist retreat going on and I was really interested in it. And, you know, from that time on, I, uh, you know, from the day I first sat in Buddhist meditation, something about it really spoke to me. And I just kept doing it really every day. It's been uh, almost 23 years now I've been doing it every day. Uh, so that gives you an idea of, uh, you know, how congenial the practice was to me as a young man. Um, I remember starting, I remember the first time I sat on the floor uh, with an intention to meditate and I'd never meditated and I never like just sat on the floor it's still for that long and I remember after five or ten minutes my back was just like there was a combination of stabbing pain on fire so the the pain was excruciating and I it wasn't possible to focus because I was just so distracted by the physical discomfort um, but what I found was that over time, uh, my body accommodated the posture, my mind also learned how to settle down. So I went from this like really uncomfortable experience, basically just thrashing in my body and mind, wondering how do these Buddhists sit on the ground without moving for hours at a time, to like, you know, over the weeks, months, and years, the practice started to smooth out it started to feel a lot more gentle to me. And in, you know, in a sense, I started to enter in more deeply to the like different nuances and depths of my experience. So at this time, as I was deepening in my meditation practice, I was learning about the Buddhist concept, the teaching of anicca or impermanence. Um, at, at the surface level, impermanence uh, is an insight in the Buddhist tradition, that things come and go, things rise and pass. And when we relate to things in the moment as being permanent, we inevitably suffer because things aren't permanent, they're passing. And what that meant on a practical level for my back pain was that if I related to my back pain as very solid, something I needed to avoid, something I needed to escape from, then I would suffer a lot. But if I recognized that there wasn't so much solidity to the pain as like a waveform, it's rising and passing, then I could let it well up and I could let it kind of move past without so much struggle, without so much reactivity to it. So I, find, I found that my insight into impermanence was deepening and I was suffering less. I was actually feeling more free in my life, more happy. So at this point, I had been meditating daily uh, for probably six or seven years. And I'm really grateful to a Buddhist teacher of mine who I still have a deep relationship and friendship with to this day by the name of Shinzen Young. Interestingly, I'll say about Shinzen, he is kind of a wizard in the, uh, the world's uh, canons. Uh, uh, for example, he, he's really conversant in multiple languages. Uh, in the Eastern canons, but he's also no slouch in our Western tradition. He's uh, a Jewish by descent, and he has a great command of the scriptures. 
And he pointed out to me, he, he kind of pointed my attention to something. He was telling me that in uh, the original Hebrew, in the uh, Old Testament, that what we call Holy Spirit in modern English uh, is Ruach HaKodesh. And that the, the metaphor that the ancient Israelites used to understand the Holy Spirit was the wind, it was a holy kind of wind. And that this was quite a brilliant metaphor in that like the wind, we can't see it. We can't experience it directly by sight, but we can feel the effects of the winds. We can feel its power. And, you know, we, we see the way it moves things to and fro. So Shinzen, it was uh, thanks to him that I was able to realize that uh, the, what we call Holy Spirit in the Judeo-Christian tradition and impermanence are actually very closely related. Why? <laughs> like I mentioned, as my meditation practice was deepening, uh, I went from this coarse level, huge discomfort, back on fire, stabbing pain in the knees, to a more settled mind, a more relaxed body. And what's difficult to describe, but it was kind of like getting to the almost microscopic level of my moment to moment experience, which felt like this dancing, vibratory aliveness. And Shinzen pointed out that, you know, we refer to the Holy Spirit in the Christian tradition as the comforter. And notice the comforting quality of impermanence you feel when things don't feel so solid, but they're more like champagne bubbles, effervescing moment to moment. It's, it's as if uh, impermanence is massaging you and breaking up the hard spots in your soul and actually restoring your connection to your spiritual source. So this was beautiful language to me from a very adept meditator, but it was also pointing me back to an experience that I thought I had left long behind. All of a sudden, many years into my Buddhist practice, I'd come to an insight into impermanence where I was starting to feel the massaging, comforting, purifying, redeeming aspects of impermanence, where literally after a meditation, I would feel more holy. I would feel cleansed. I would feel redeeming love in my body, in my heart, in my mind. And all of a sudden, this tradition I'd been participating in almost as an act of rebellion, thinking I'd left Christianity behind, it had unexpectedly brought me full circle through the back door of Christianity. And here I was having a deeply Buddhist experience of impermanence and realizing that all I actually was, was a wash in Holy Spirit. So this was a game changer for me. And how do I put this? That I have grown up learning in the Christian tradition, in the Latter-day Saint tradition specifically, that you know, the Holy Spirit uh, is uh, company to us if we don't offend it, if we're obedient, if we do what we should be doing. And don't get me wrong, um, as far as I can tell, we never outgrow the commandments. It's important like, to obey. And that is a critical aspect of having the presence of the Spirit with us. But another aspect of a life in the Spirit that I didn't appreciate until deep into my Buddhist practice was that the quality of my attention, the quality of my mind and my awareness moment to moment would determine how aware I was, how alive I was to the activity of the Holy Spirit moment to moment. Until this time in my life, what the Holy Spirit meant to me, it was like this entity that would come and go depending on whether or not I was worthy of the Spirit. Uh, what my Buddhist training helped me understand, not intellectually, but somatically in an embodied and direct way and experience that the Holy Spirit, the light and the power of Christ is literally 
truly in and through all things. And that if I was paying proper attention, I could actually experience that moment to moment. The way at a microscopic level, the Holy Spirit, Anicca, impermanence, was refining me, was comforting me, was purifying me. I'll close with uh, just a phrase from one of my favorite scriptures that's taken on a whole new meaning to me, um, just in my life as a disciple, in my life as a meditator, as a contemplative. It's when Paul is talking to the Athenians in the book of Acts, and he's bearing witness uh, to Christ. He's bearing witness to the living God. And he says of this living God, it is in him we live and move and have our being. For me, the practice of contemplation has become an opportunity not to read scripture and have faith in scripture, so much as to become scripture, to become this very territory that Paul points to and bears witness to. Uh, when we are in a state of open-hearted, present moment awareness, we begin to feel and become more sensitive, more and more sensitive to this field of aliveness, of light, of spirit, this dancing vitality in which we live and move and have our being. So you can add that to your repertoire as a Latter-day Saint, as a Christian, or just as a human being, that it's not just our behavior that allows us to uh, taste of the fruits of the spirit, but it's in the way we pay attention and the way we sanctify each and every moment with the quality of our attention that brings the spirit more fully to life in our lives. And I leave these words with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. This is Ahmad Salah, a Muslim student imam here on um, BYU campus. Um, the words in Arabic that I started with today is the general uh, greetings uh, in the Muslim world. And it um, translates to um, peace be upon you. Um, as living here uh, in Provo, Utah, we've um, start, uh, we've learned that we start everything with a prayer. Um, but that is not new to us, to uh, Muslims. We also start with a prayer. Um, and a close translation uh, here is by the name of Allah, the most merciful, the most gracious. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in Arabic. Um, as you see, it's very short and sweet, um, but it is the prayer that we should uh, say every time we start anything. Start reading, um, start a session like this, uh, start driving, uh, start eating. Um, it's the start of anything that we embark on. Uh, today, I'm, I'm very uh, grateful to be able to um, talk uh, here uh, to you all, and I will start also with a verse from the Quran, uh, our holy book. Um, it's one of my uh, favorite ones to discuss as we talk about um, interfaith discussions. And and the verse from the Quran says, "Ya yonas, inna khalaqnakum min dakarin wa unta." And I would say the translation as, as we uh, keep going here. Uh, o mankind, we created you from a single pair of male and female, and we made you into nations and tribes so you can get to know each other. Indeed, uh, the best among you to Allah is the one that exercises the most piety. I want to stop right here uh, and just indicate 
uh, one thing. Uh, this verse, there are a couple things that I can talk about on this verse, but I will keep it short and sweet. The, the verse teaches us uh, that the best among us, literally the best among us in the eyes of uh, Allah, of God, um, the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah, of course, in, in Arabic is, is God, and we, we praise Allah. We say subhanahu wa ta'ala, so we praise uh, Allah. Um, the best among us is the one that exercises most, uh, the, the most piety. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God did not indicate to us that the best is uh, richest or the strongest or the one with the gold medal. Um, so again, that's, that's a truth in what we are taught, what have been a privilege to be taught as I grew up. Um, and also uh, that's what we teach to uh, in the Friday prayer that we will have uh, um, here in a little bit on campus. And we do that uh, every Friday. So our Sabbath is a Friday. Um, so that's what we try to teach um, fellow, other fellow uh, brothers and sisters. Um, with that uh, in mind, I want just to take us in a cultic journey uh, in time by the start and the end of, um, of the Quranic verses that we uh, believe that's the true word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And um, it started with one verse, and that one verse is Iqra in, in Arabic, and that close that translation, not the close translation, that true translation is read. Um, so the first uh, fact that we've learned uh, about uh, the true word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is read, knowledge. Um, th that is not gain, that is not work, that is not uh, be strong, um, none of that. It is, it's read, it's knowledge. Um, and so that's, that's another fact that I wanted to start our uh, uh, short journey here uh, together. It's short in time, but it's kind of uh, lengthy in value, if you will. Um, before we get to the end, uh, there are a few concepts that I wanted to share with you um, that are more factual uh, in, in nature, uh, truthful, um, and, and these are kind of, again, facts and um, concepts, if you will, that we live by, Muslims uh, do uh, live by. I'll start with one that I, I myself experienced here when I first came to uh, BYU. Um, as I was walking uh, down from um, the DT, the Desert Towers, to my building, the Clyde building that I was uh, doing some studies uh, in. Um, I, as, as I was walking, I was seeing uh, a number, everybody pretty much that I was walking and getting eye contact with um, were smiling, just smiling at me. And at that time I was not married. That was a good 20 years ago. Um, so I was not married coming here from uh, Cairo, Egypt, like, okay, great. I'm going to have a good time, especially, you know, most of the um, people that I was seeing at the time, well, not most, some of, uh, are girls. So they were smiling at me like, that's great. Uh, I'm going to have a good time here uh, in Provo, Utah. Um, the first thing that I learned on campus when I talked to my uh, supervisor, my PhD supervisor, when I, I was telling him this experience, he laughed and he said, well, uh, were taught, uh, you know, you would see this uh, all over and you would see people smiling. Um, like Coming from Cairo, Egypt, and very metropolitan, very busy, if I have somebody smiling at me, that's, that's a problem. Even though that is a teaching of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, that smiling to your brother or sister's face uh, is, a good, is a good deed. So it actually reminded me with the similarities that we have between uh, Islam and uh, LDS. Um, and, and that started uh, or triggered the process uh, in my mind of, of uh, 
loving the idea of interface discussions. That was 20 years ago. I don't think that uh, stopped. Um, uh, another teaching of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that we live by is uh, be good to your, again, close translation, be good to your seventh neighbor. Not the first neighbor, not the second neighbor, but the seventh neighbor. Um, I think of, of that, again, as a similarity with the LDS uh, religion is the word activities in, in the world. We've, we have participated as a family in a number of activities activities uh, for our word. Um, another um, concept that we live by is as Muslims, we have to, we must believe in all uh, prophets, all books, all religions, and all uh, angels. There's no question about it. There's no interpretation. This, this verse in the Quran is not subject to interpretation uh, or different interpretation. It's just a single uh, interpretation. Another concept that I wanted to share um, with you here is consultation. Um, there are numerous uh, occasions uh, in Islam in the uh, life of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, um, that um, as, as a leader, um, of course, uh, a prophet, but also a community uh, leader uh, of the first Muslim nation, if you, if you will, at the time, um, he had a lot of consultation council, uh, if you will, to, to discuss different community, uh, whether that's economic, you know, environmental, health, whatever the situation, and at, in some cases, of course, at wartime. So um, given the culture at that, at that time. So this, this consultation concept that we're at, I'm a civil engineering consultant myself, so I, I value that as a factual thing that was taught to us by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the concept of, of, of religion. And, and a few verses in the Quran that we don't have time to go over. Um, um, the, I'll try to wrap up here. The, as I started with read the first verse in the Quran, the, of course we believe uh, in the unity uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is only one God. Um, and, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the ultimate knowledge, the ultimate power, the ultimate, the supreme power. Um, and, and the knowledge is, uh, is there. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us our minds and, and intellectual ability, abilities um, to develop these technologies that we're all using, including today. And I'm glad I'm not wearing a mask today, at least for now. Um, but develop all of these protection. The mask is, is something that we have developed because of the knowledge that we were granted by the ultimate knowledge source, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So again, um, uh, something here to, to try to conclude. The other um, two things here more to try to conclude. Um, believing in prophets, um, it, it, prophets are human beings. They have, um, they are human beings. We believe that hum they are human beings, but they uh, have miracles because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because of, of God that granted that. Um, another thing, the pilgrimage, those of you that have seen Muslims uh, do the pilgrimage in Mecca uh, once every year, about two, two, two point five million people in the same place, wearing the same thing, doing the same thing. What are they wearing? They're wearing white, simple garments. No difference between uh, the richest or the poorest, the strongest or the weakest. People on wheelchair wearing the same thing. People walking wearing the same thing. Athletes are doing the same thing. Um, and with with that, I'd like to to conclude um, with one verse. Like I started with one verse from the Quran, and and that verse. Um, um, and it says, Close translation. <clears throat> Today, I've, I've perfected your religion, completed my favor upon um, you, of, as a, and completed my favor upon you. Let's stop. All right. Hey, I, one of you ready. Okay.
I'm ready. I will start. اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي ورديت لكم الإسلام دينا. The close translation to this verse is: Today I've perfected your religion and completed my favor upon you and accepted Islam as a religion and a way of commitment in your life as peace. That is my um, end of the journey. Uh, and before we close, again, the commitment in our life, the perfection that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about, the completion of the religion is focused on one word, peace. Peace be upon you all. Talk to you soon. Good morning. It is my honor and privilege to have been invited to speak at this year's International Society Annual Conference. The building up of Zion, said Joseph Smith, is a cause that has interested people of God in every age. It is a theme upon which prophets, priests, and kings have dwelt with peculiar delight. Indeed, Joseph added, we ought to have the building up of Zion as our greatest object. In the book of Moses, chapter seven, the prophet Enoch witnesses God weeping abjectly for the children of the earth and asks God not once, but three times, how is it that thou canst weep, seeing thou art holy and from all eternity to all eternity? Most importantly for this discussion, God's preoccupation is not with human sin and evil, but with their suffering. Wherefore, God answers Moses, should not the heavens weep, seeing that these, my children, shall suffer. The opposite word is suffer, not sin. Christians are taught that of all the commandments, two are the greatest. First, to love God, and second, to love our fellow man. While our duty to love God is paramount, it is our failure to love one another that elicits God's grief. And unto thy brethren have I said, and also given commandment, that they should love one another, and that they should choose me, their father. But behold, they are without affection, and they hate their own blood. God laments not that the children fail to worship him, but that they are contending with each other. Indeed, the Book of Mormon suggests that our loving one another is worshiping God. The Book of Mormon's King Benjamin emphatically admonishes his people to succor those who stand in need of succor, not to turn away any in need of aid and put him out to perish. You might say to yourself, this man has brought upon himself his misery, therefore I will stay my hand and will not give unto him of my food, nor impart unto him my substance that he may not suffer. For his punishments are just, but I say unto you, O man, whosoever doeth this, the same hath great cause to repent. For are we not all beggars? Marvelous organizations and religious traditions around the globe take these guiding principles to heart. A top priority for Catholic relief services includes the preservation of the dignity and sanctity of all human life by working to eliminate disease and poverty and to nurture the building of peaceful and just societies, regardless of creed, race, or nationality. In their mission statement, Islamic Relief USA seeks to administer relief regardless of gender, race, or religion, and to work to empower individuals in their communities in order that they too may have a voice in the world. We remain guided by the timeless values and teachings provided by the revelations contained within the Quran and prophetic example. We believe the protection and well-being of every life is of paramount importance, and we shall join with other humanitarian actors to act as one in responding to suffering brought on by disasters, poverty, and injustice. We work to empower the dispossessed towards realizing their God-given human potential 
and develop their capabilities and resources. Additionally, Islamic Relief seeks to uphold the Muslim duty of custodianship over the earth and its resources. Societies unaffiliated with religious traditions are also involved in alleviating global suffering. Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, was founded in Paris in 1971 by a group of journalists and doctors in the wake of war and famine in Biafra. The organization, now comprising almost 65,000 volunteers, is a non-profit, self-governed, member-based organization, providing medical assistance to people affected by conflict, epidemics, disaster, or exclusion from healthcare around the globe, irrespective of nationality, religious tradition, or political affiliation. Their priority is foremost to those in the most serious and immediate danger, and as a result, place their, place their own lives in danger. Zion comprises all who are seeking to create a better world by alleviating suffering and poverty, by sharing their substance, material or otherwise, to create a unified global society in which there are no societal gradations, no rich and poor, no bond and free. A society in which peace rather than contention prevails, a global community to which Christ will return. The Lord said unto Enoch, thou and all thy city shall meet us on earth and we will receive them into our bosom and they shall see us and we will fall upon their necks and they shall fall upon our necks and we will kiss each other and there shall be mine abode and it shall be Zion, which shall come forth out of all creation and the earth shall rest. The Messiah will prepare a feast of fat things unto which all nations shall be invited. For as Brigham Young has said, God is compassionate to all the works of his hands, the plan of his redemption and salvation and mercy is stretched out over all and his plans are to gather up and bring together and save all the inhabitants of the earth. The idea of a global Zion is not new. It was embraced by many of the early church fathers. Gregory of Nyssa suggested that because creation exists from the very beginning by divine power, it is, its end is linked with its beginning. Gregory's idea of the perfection of humankind was a forward-looking attainment. Since the beloved is infinite, so is the soul's progressive advance towards God, infinite. That is, we are all inherently divine. Gregory's sister and teacher Macrina stated that this is why anger cannot be found in God. For humans are drawn to the image of God in their hearts, that is a compassionate, non-coercive love. This dynamism, Macrina suggests, comes from the godlike qualities of the human soul which attract her to the divine. She attaches herself to God by means of the movement and activity of love because the advance of the soul is through love. God works with humankind on this principle only. Indeed, the deification of humankind is God's sole purpose for the creation. According to the book of Moses, God's work and glory is to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of every person who has ever lived or will live on our planet. However, as Martin Luther King Jr. wrote in his letter from a Birmingham jail, human progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts of men and women willing to be co-workers with God. The Russian Orthodox theologian Nikolai Badayev calls those who work with God for the redemption of mankind in this new age, 
courageous sons and daughters of freedom. Badaev calls the new age the eighth day of creation, the time in which liberty and equality shall flourish in a global community where peace presides. William Penn calls Zion builders the humble, meek, merciful, and just souls who are everywhere of one religion. As Elder Theodor M. Burton reminded members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we are a part of a total community. We are all members of one family, for God hath made of one blood all nations. In Doctrine and Covenants, chapter 10, during a conversation about the lost manuscript, God abruptly turns his attention to another audience, whom he calls his church. As this particular section was recorded in 1829, it seems clear that those to whom he is speaking are not members of the LDS tradition. Starting in verse 51, God reassures his other church that this part of my gospel about to blossom shall be a boon to humanity, to those who are already striving to build a Zion community. I do not bring this part of my gospel to destroy that which you have received. I do not say this to destroy my church, but I say this to build up my church. Therefore, whosoever belongs to my church need not fear, for such shall inherit the kingdom of heaven. To which church is God referring? Perhaps it is the church of which Jakob Burma speaks, die Kirche ohne Mauer, the church without walls. The universal church, the congregation of which comprises those of all faith traditions or no faith tradition, who are motivated by one goal, to love and serve their neighbor, whomever and wherever she may be. I would like to address briefly how the LDS iteration of Christianity conceives their role in the building of Zion and the particular theological resources this tradition brings to the effort. So central is the concept of building Zion to the Latter-day Saints that the term occurs almost 300 times in their canon. I believe four ideas to be particularly potent. First, Joseph Smith conceived God, the Father's participation in human history, as empathic. In other words, the LDS iteration of Christianity proposes that God's involvement in humanity is predicated upon absolute love that is necessarily grounded in vulnerability. Sigmund Freud stated that one is never so defenseless against suffering as when one loves. This is the God revealed in the Book of Moses, chapter 7. Dietrich Bonhoeffer suggests that it is through God's vulnerability that all humankind is drawn to him. Second, the 1830 version of the Book of Mormon refers to humankind as occupying a state of awful woundedness rather than sinfulness. Following in the path of the early Eastern Church Fathers, Latter-day Saints perceive our life on earth as a painful but necessary educational period in which we learn how to be little Christs. Third, in the LDS tradition, Eve's eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge shows not only great courage, but her deep desire to embrace wisdom, which is why she is given the title, Mother of All Living. God's response to the couple's ingestion of the fruit is one of joy. They have become as one of us, knowing, experiencing good and evil. Eve repeats the same wording in her Ode to Joy in Moses chapter 11. Had we not eaten of the fruit, we never should have known good and evil, experienced good and evil, or the joy of our redemption. In the book of Abraham chapter 6, God redefines sin and evil as bitterness. Of Eve's decision to eat of the fruit of the tree of wisdom, Elder Wilford Woodruff notes, in life, all must choose at times. Sometimes two possibilities are good. Neither is evil. 
Usually, however, one is of greater import than the other. When in doubt, each must choose that which concerns the good of others, the greater law, rather than that which chiefly benefits ourselves, the lesser law. That was the choice made in Eden. President Cheko Okasaki noted that at the end of this process, our heavenly parents will have sons and daughters who are their peers, their friends, and their colleagues. Mortality is, in this light, a necessary immersion of humankind into the crucible of experience, suffering and schooling in the practice of love to help them become more, not less, like God. The fifth century bishop Theodoret of Cyrus stated that mortal beings are necessarily subject to passions and fears, to pleasures and sorrows, to anger and hatred. That is the reality of an embodiment that is subject to the constraints of natural law, not Adamic sin. Freed from the onus of a framework that sees humans as fallen, depraved, or conceived in sin, one is now in a position to reconsider the role of Christ himself. The scriptural title Sota is generally translated as savior. However, the Greek root sodzo is used in reference to the many acts of healing performed by Jesus of Nazareth, be they physical, psychological, spiritual, or emotional. We might, with linguistic accuracy, therefore, refer to Christ as the Sota, the healer of the world. Elder Dale G. Rendon states succinctly, as the good shepherd Jesus Christ views disease in his sheep as a condition that needs treatment, care, and compassion, this shepherd, our good shepherd, finds joy in seeing his diseased sheep progress toward healing. In the Book of Alma, Christ's mission is described specifically as one of healing. And he shall go forth, suffering pains and afflictions and temptations of every kind. And this that the word might be fulfilled, which he saith he will take upon him, the pains and the sicknesses of his people. And he will take upon him death, that he may loose the bands of death which bind his people. And he will take upon him their infirmities, that his bowels may be filled with mercy according to the flesh, that he may know according to the flesh how to succor his people according to their infirmities. Humankind, as Martin Luther King suggested, is invited to collaborate with Christ in healing those in our sphere of influence. At their baptism, each initiate is invited to make three covenants with God. One, to carry one another's burdens. Two, to mourn with those who mourn. And three, to comfort those in need of comfort, whomsoever she may be. What I find to be absolutely remarkable is that each member of the Godhead is represented in each of the covenants. The God who carries our burdens through his life into Gethsemane and onto Golgotha is Jesus the Christ. The God who mourns in empathy with our suffering is God the Father, the weeping God revealed to Enoch. The God who comforts those who stand in need of comfort is God the Holy Spirit. By assuming those identical charges, the LDS enter into a covenant to collaborate with the Godhead in the healing of humanity, engaging in the same work of mourning, sharing burdens, and lifting. Of course, one does not need to be a member of the LDS community in order to practice these principles of healing. As we have seen, people of all religious persuasions, or none, across the world are engaged in lifting the hands that hang down and strengthening the feeble knees. Zion building requires the efforts of all people of goodwill throughout the world. The particular covenants made within the LDS baptismal ordinance 
are a very emphatic call to exert ourselves in this work. We are invited to collaborate with Christ in the healing of our wounded world. The saints do this in the very real hope of constructing the kingdom of heaven on earth in anticipation of the Lord's coming with glory when heaven and earth can join. Thank you. It's my great pleasure to be here with all of you today. I want to thank the BYU International Society for inviting me to present here at this wonderful conference and with such great colleagues on this panel. Um, I was asked to speak on behalf of Hinduism, which is my own uh, tradition of practice since my childhood. Now, I should begin by saying that Hinduism is a very uh, vast religious tradition. It's, um, it's more like a family of religious traditions rather than just a single religion. Uh, and so I particularly come from that branch of Hinduism known as Vaishnavism, or those who worship Krishna or Vishnu as the supreme deity. So that's kind of the perspective I'll be talking from. And I was asked to speak about um, the, the truth and joy that I find in my own tradition. Uh, that, of course, is a very large topic. And um, I could and I, I do speak for hours on this topic in many different contexts. Uh, but I'll, I'll try to just choose a couple of things that come to mind, particularly as being um, special to me in terms of both truth and joy, uh, which are, of course, you know, uh, closely related uh, topics and ideas. So when it comes to truth, uh, the first thing that comes to mind for me is um, a, a, a beautiful verse that's found in one of our sacred texts called the Bhagavata Purana. This is a sacred text that I work on academically as well. And um, the Bhagavata Purana is thousands of verses in this Sanskrit language. Uh, Sanskrit is India's ancient language, kind of like Latin or Greek is uh, for Europe. It's Sanskrit is the mother of uh, most Northern Indian languages. Um, and um, this uh, particular verse, it's the first verse in the Bhagavata Purana, uh, and it has something to say about truth. It goes like this. Janma dyasya yatun vayaditaratash chartishva bhiknya svara tene brahma hridaya adikavaye mohyanti yatsuraya Tejo vari mridam yatha vinimayo yatratri sargo mrisha dhamna svena sada nirasta kohakam satyam param dhimahi. So it's a long and very meaningful verse, but the phrase that I want to focus on is vedyam vastavam atra vastu shivadam, which can be translated as follows, that truth um, is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. So I'll say that again, truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. Now, the, this description or definition of truth has two parts to it. And the first one, is that truth is that which is real. It's reality distinguished or separated from illusion, that which is deceptive, that which is fake. So it's true, not deceptive. Now, this might seem very intuitive and common sense and obvious, but um, in fact, it, it holds a very profound um, truth for Hindus, which is the idea that if something is true, it is real, and that which is real is um, true everywhere, at all times, in all places, right? It's ever existent. Uh, and um, uh, it's not something that comes in and out of existence. That's true sometimes, but not true at other times. That's real for some people, but not for others. It's consistent, it's ever present. Uh, this in Sanskrit is called sat that which exists, that which is eternal. 
So what this means for Hindus, what this means for me, is that when I find something of truth in my own tradition, in my own religious practice, I expect to find it in other traditions as well. Uh, I know in, in, for, for some people to see truth or to find truth in another person's religious tradition uh, can be frightening or can be threatening um, because uh, we might feel insecure that if it's there in someone else's, then what makes my religion special or unique? But in fact, for me, the opposite is true, that if I see some truth present in a variety of different traditions across the world, that gives me more confidence that that truth found in my own tradition is actually real, that it's actually true. Or to put it the other way, if something is true in my own tradition, I expect to find it in other traditions as well. And for me, that helps solidify my faith. It helps make it deeper. The fact that it is present in multiple places, in multiple contexts, that human beings in a variety of religious traditions recognize something about that as being deeply real, deeply true. Now, at the same time, that eternal, ever-present truth is also contextual. It also, it, it is applied in a particular time and place according to the needs and abilities and, and, and culture of a particular group of people, right? So both of these things are true. That truth is eternal, it's ever present, but it's also contextual. It's also applied according to a particular time and place and people and audience. This is called Desha Kala Patra which means time, place, and audience. These three things affect the way that that truth is applied or expressed. And here comes the second part of the definition, which is that um, truth is reality distinguished from illusion. Okay, we talked about that. For the welfare of all. In other words, when that truth is applied contextually, it should do good in the world. It should do well for persons, for people. Now, if, I mean, there are many things that are true, that are factual in this world, but they're not automatically or necessarily good, right? Um, that's something that we as human beings have to do ourselves. We have to take those truths and apply them in a way that does good for others, that is for the welfare of all, it's for goodness in the world. Um, take technology, for example. Uh, we know technology by itself is neither good nor bad. Uh, it can do amazingly wonderful things. It can also tear us apart. It can also, um, uh, uh, um, uh, it, it, can, it can facilitate relationships and it can break apart relationships, depending on how we use that technology um, and, and how, what we deploy it for. This Zoom that I'm recording on is a very fine example of a form of technology that is very, very useful and allows us to connect from faraway places and participate in conferences like this one. But at the same time, it's a very poor substitute for face-to-face -face interaction and relationships that might take place in a family or in a church or in other places like that, right? So everything has its two sides. And therefore, both aspects of this definition are crucial. Truth is reality distinguished from illusion. Yes, it's real. Yes, it's true. But it must also be for the welfare of all. And that's up to us. How do we contextually apply that truth in such a way that it benefits us and benefits those around us? Um, and this represents a very fundamental element of Vaishnavism, of the branch of Hinduism that I practice. Uh, the idea of achintya bheda bheda. Now that's a long, long um, word. Uh, it, it means something very simple in English. It means unity in diversity. The fundamental nature of reality for us is that things are consistent, they're present everywhere, like the nature of truth I described, and yet its application is diverse. And so unity in diversity, many things, but all put together. Um, that's heda, heda. Um, 
which is the central um, truth of the tradition that I practice. Now, a one a wonderful example of that unity and diversity, of that eternal truth contextually applied, uh, comes in the form of the practice that we do on a regular basis. And this goes to the second point I wanted to speak about, which is the joy found within the tradition. What is it about my tradition that I find joyful? And of course, there are many things uh, in my own practice, but the one thing I want to highlight, because it illustrates this point well, is the idea of kirtan. Uh, kirtan is, means uh, praising, singing, glorifying the name of God. Now, this is one of the most consistent practices in India and for Vaishnavas across the board. Uh, we sing and we chant and we dance and we uh, repeat the name of God in silent meditation as well, right? So it's a form of meditation. It's a form of congregational singing together. And it's most importantly an act of devotion. It's an act of worship for the Lord. Um, the name of God is something, uh, praising the name of God is something that you find in religious traditions across the world. Of course, each one calls upon the name in different ways and praises that name in different ways. But this is something that you find across religious traditions in the world. Um, for us, the name of God is something very special. It's very unique. Um, in general, names are very important uh, because in a name, we invest our um, relationship with a person. Um, I, I remember when um, my wife and I, we had our first child, our son, he, our, our elder son, we were thinking of, of names to give him, uh, what would be a good name. And there was one name in particular, it's a very beautiful name we were thinking of considering, but the challenge was that we knew someone by that name who we didn't really like. Now, the name and that person, of course, different. We could have named our child that, but that name became a carrier of our emotions, our feeling, our relationship with that person, right? That wasn't all that um, pleasant. Uh, on the other hand, there were other names that really appealed to us because those names carried with them a lot of feeling and emotion. And of course, now the, the names of our children, Chaitanya and Purushottam, they have so much meaning and feeling. All our relationship and our love for them is carried in those names. So that when I hear someone else randomly with one of those names, it gives me great joy just to hear that name. So a name is a very powerful thing. And when it comes to the name of God, the same is true. We invest in that name, our feelings, our relationship, our emotions towards the Lord, our devotion towards the Lord. And calling upon his name becomes an act of expressing those devo that devotion, that relationship we have. For us, our favorite name is Krishna. The word Krishna is a name for God in Sanskrit, which means the all attractive one, and namely the one who draws all beings towards him. And for us, this name is special because it speaks again to that quality of universal truth that I was speaking about earlier. Everywhere you go in the world, any religion, any tradition, any culture, any country in present days and in the ancient past, everywhere we find each culture calling upon the Lord, calling upon God in different ways, right? Sometimes in a personal way, as a personal deity, sometimes as a divine energy, sometimes as an ultimate principle, however they might conceive that ultimate being, that divine being, cultures all over the world are drawn to that supreme divine. And that's why this name of Krishna as the one who is all attractive, who draws all beings towards him like a magnet, we find that to be a very special name for God as it's expressed particularly in the Sanskrit language. 
So singing and chanting this name of God, uh, Krishna, uh, gives us great joy. And for me particularly, both in private personal meditation and also in congregational singing, chanting and dancing. So that's, um, that's uh, just a little bit about the ideas of both truth and joy as I find them in my own tradition of Vaishnava Hinduism. Thank you all again so much for listening to me and for this opportunity to say a few words and share with you today amongst my um, esteemed colleagues on this panel. Thank you and namaste. Thank you so much to each of our panelists. We're excited to have been here today and look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, panelists. What a privilege. We have been lifted, strengthened, and inspired by your words, by your spirit, by your goodness, by your truths. Thank you. We invite you all to join with us tomorrow at 9 a.m. Mountain Daylight Time for a continuation of this conference. Tomorrow's program appears on your screen. The International Society is a network and service organization of Latter-day Saint professionals. We invite you to visit our website and apply for membership. Once again, we thank you for your participation this day and look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you.